This is the network for continuing medical education, supported by Roche Laboratories. According to the National Institute of Health, 10 million Americans use snuff or chewing tobacco on a regular basis. At least 3 million of these users are under the age of 21. Does this increasing use of smokeless tobacco pose a serious threat to public health? From the Network for Continuing Medical Education, this is smokeless tobacco, a new threat to public health. With Dr. Thomas Robbins, Assistant Professor of Surgery, Department of Head and Neck Surgery, MD Anderson Hospital and Tumor Institute of the University of Texas System Cancer Center in Houston. Exploring the problem with Dr. Robbins will be Dr. Alan Bloom, founder of DOC and former editor of the Medical Journal of Australia. Dr. Bloom's special interest is disease prevention and the effects of tobacco and its promotion. In the past decade, there has been a rise in the use of smokeless tobacco in this country. Smokeless tobacco includes snuff and chewing tobacco. Snuff refers to powdered tobacco. In the United States, snuff dipping is applying the powder to the recess between the lip and gum. Chewing tobacco is shredded tobacco, usually mixed with some form of sweetener, either molasses or syrup. A quid refers to a small portion of snuff or chewing tobacco, and a chaw is a large portion, a golf ball size, that people chew. This habit, particularly snuff dipping, was once traditionally limited to a small population in the South. Now it has grown to include more than 10 million users, many of them teenagers. Tom, how does consumption of cigarettes compare to smokeless tobacco? The overall use of tobacco has decreased from 1970 through to 1982. The yellow line uh, shown in the graph represents the use of tobacco for males and females. The strongest downward trend has been in the males over 18 for cigarette and cigar smoking. Cigarette smoking in women has actually continued to rise. Most importantly, uh, for purposes of this discussion, consumption of chewing tobacco is rising steadily. Tom, as a cancer surgeon specializing in the head and neck, how do you feel the increased use of smokeless tobacco is going to affect the overall incidence and mortality due to cancer? The major risk factors for these cancers are alcohol and tobacco use. Ninety percent of patients who develop the disease use one or both of these products. According to the National Cancer Institute, more than half of these cancers arose in the oral cavity and the oropharynx, which of course is the area most at risk for users of smokeless tobacco. Other head and neck cancers include such areas as the larynx, uh, the thyroid, nose, uh, cervical esophagus, and the nasopharynx. Our main concern then is that a significant health problem is progressively getting worse. In this program, we will describe the devastating effects of oral cancer and how this can only get worse if we don't begin to work now to challenge the growing problem of smokeless tobacco. The chief role of our discussion, as we see it, is to engage you in becoming more active on an individual and a community-wide basis in discouraging the use of these products. The real message here is prevention. Asking every young person that comes into the office if he or she uses any tobacco product is the single most important action that you can take in preventing tobacco use. It's a matter of getting people off the product if they have started using it and stopping them before they ever begin to use it. With this preventive-oriented approach in mind, we would like to discuss the clinical effects of smokeless tobacco. Tom, what is the spectrum of effects that you see in smokeless tobacco users? Prolonged use of smokeless tobacco causes snuff dippers keratosis. Initially, there is a pale gray discoloration of the mucosa where the snuff is applied. For orientation on this picture, the lower lip has been retracted to show this lesion. With progressive use, the discoloration becomes yellowish brown and the mucosa becomes elevated and more irregular looking. With continued use, leukoplakia may develop. This is a, this is a term used by clinicians to describe a whitish irregular patch of mucosa which cannot be rubbed off. Some forms of leukoplakia may be irregular or have areas of erythema. Leukoplakia should not really be confused with other white lesions in the mouth such as candidiasis or a, a bacterial infection. Microscopically, leukoplakia can be associated with several histologic changes. This is a section of tissue from the mucosa. 
the red area represents an excessive accumulation of keratin referred to as hyperkeratosis. Now normally only a small amount of keratin is seen here. Hyperkeratosis is usually what gives the lesion its whitish appearance. What is the delay between the onset of use of smokeless tobacco and the development of leukoplakia? I don't think any of the epidemiologic studies have specifically determined this, and in fact, it may vary among individuals. Nevertheless, the high incidence of leukoplakia found in college athletes who use smokeless tobacco, approximately 64% according to Kristen's survey, indicates a relatively short time interval of several months to a few years between initial use and the onset of leukoplakia. What do we know about the mechanism and the rate of transformation from leukoplakia to cancer? The rate of transformation is low and may take several years. This diagram demonstrates the evolution of cancer from leukoplakia. Squamous cells line the surface of the mucosa and basal cells form the lower layers. Now normally there is an orderly maturation whereby the basal cells lose their nuclei and become flat as the more superficial squamous cells are desquamated. The initial event in malignant transformation is hyperplasia of these basal cells. With progression, cellular atypia or dysplasia develops, and this becomes more severe until carcinoma in situ occurs. When these cancer cells break through the basement membrane, invasive carcinoma then develops. What are the transformation rates of leukoplakia? Studies have indicated that the rate of transformation is between 3 to 7 percent. This study by Silverman, however, showed that if the leukoplakia is associated with areas of redness, the transformation rate is much higher, in his series, 23 percent. Also, if areas of dysplasia are demonstrated on biopsy, the transformation rate is even higher, in his series, 36 percent. Hmm. Will, will treating leukoplakia prevent oral cancers? And if so, how is the premalignant lesion treated? The initial treatment of leukoplakia is to remove all possible etiologic factors, such as tobacco and sources of irritation, such as the dentures. And if this, there is persistence or a change in appearance, such as ulceration, nodularity, or redness, then excision or at least a biopsy should be performed. Chewing and smoking tobacco, as well as alcohol consumption, then place the user at risk of head and neck cancers. Tom, what types of cancers are most common in users of smokeless tobacco? Smokeless tobacco users who develop cancer are more likely to have a verrucous carcinoma, which is a type of squamous cell carcinoma. Verrucous cancer spreads superficially and may cover a large surface area without necessarily invading the underlying stroma and metastasizing to the regional lymph nodes. Here's an example of verrucous carcinoma. This one involves the upper part of the jaw and extends to the buccal sulcus. What is the evidence that smokeless tobacco causes cancer? The evidence comes from epidemiologic studies and retrospective analysis of patients who develop carcinoma of the oral cavity and pharynx. The largest of these uh, studies come from India, where chewing tobacco is very common, often combined with the betel nut. In India, about 40% of all cancers arise in the mouth, the most common site for cancer in that country. Those patients who develop oral cavity cancer usually have it on the buccal mucosa. 75% of patients who develop cancer at this site use smokeless tobacco. The, de the epidemiologic studies, and there have been several of them, demonstrate a four to five fold risk associated with the habit. While these facts are frightening, it is not completely accurate to compare the population of India to this country. For instance, there may be nutritional differences in India that may influence the high incidence of oral cancer, and one must also consider the effects of the betel nut. But still, even when you consider those differences, it's a strong association. In this country, one of the key studies was conducted by Wynn, who evaluated an area in the southeastern United States where snuff dipping is popular among certain groups of women. She recorded information about the number of years women dip snuff and then compared the relative risk to non-users in the same area. The startling conclusion of this study is that those women who dip snuff for more than 50 years had an almost 50-fold risk compared to the non-user group. This study shows that not only does the risk increase dramatically, but that it is associated with long-term use, suggesting a strong dependency on the substance. 
That's precisely the alarming aspect of this problem. Now that American teenagers are picking up this habit, they may go on to use it for years, which will increase their risk dramatically. But this epidemic of smokeless tobacco use in teens may not be reflected in higher mortality until 30 or 40 years from now. Another interesting study, again looking at women in the southeast, was conducted by, by McGuirt in 1983. Of the 290 cases of head and neck cancers, 76 of them used snuff. 57 used snuff exclusively. The others used snuff and tobacco. Normally, head and neck cancer has a strong male predominance, at least 4 to 1. In this group, there is a female predominance of 3 to 1. 47% had buccal cancer, and 32% had alveolar cancer, the area where snuff was directly applied. McGuirt concluded that snuff dippers carcinoma was mainly a verrucous cancer. The recurrence rate was high, and the cancer was difficult to control, an important point clinically. However, it did have a lower incidence of metastases. Looking at some of the habits of people using smokeless tobacco, Kristen surveyed Texas college athletes and found that one-third used smokeless tobacco. And after clinical examination, one half of them had leukoplakia. None had cancer. But if they continue to use tobacco, how many will eventually develop it? In 1986, in Miami, dentists screening high school athletes for oral lesions found a startling number of early changes. In one school, they found lesions in 8 out of 12 athletes who all used smokeless tobacco. One of the subtle dangers of smokeless tobacco is that it can be used more discreetly than tobacco that is smoked. Thus, many parents are not aware that their children are using this product. Schaefer in Dallas conducted a survey recently to identify tobacco users among high school and lower grade students. 9% use smokeless tobacco regularly, and 15% use cigarettes. 22% of those had initiated the habit while under the age of 9. I think that's alarming. The subjects were also asked, what do you think is more harmful, smoking or chewing tobacco? While the majority did think that smoking tobacco was harmful, a much lower proportion felt that chewing tobacco was harmful. This confirms the belief, then, that teenagers look upon smokeless tobacco as being a less harmful product. And this may be due to the fact that smokeless tobacco has been subtly promoted as a safer alternative to smoking. That's true. And if we do have an epidemic of smokeless tobacco use and cigarette use declines, oral cavity cancer may actually surpass lung cancer as a major killer 30 to 40 years from now. It certainly exists in India, and there is no reason why it can't turn around in this country if that type of social conduct is encouraged. This is an advanced stage of oral cancer and represents a significant problem for treatment. This type of cancer can only be treated effectively with surgery and radiation and possibly chemotherapy. Radiation alone cannot cure the cancer because it is too deep and infiltrative. The best chance for cure is a combined treatment. Adequate resection of the tumor for this patient required a portion of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and the adjacent mandible. For some patients, combined treatment means a significant loss of function and disfigurement, as illustrated in the picture of this woman who now no longer has a mandible. This patient of mine chewed tobacco for many years. He developed a large cancer in the buccal mucosa. The cancer was invading the upper and lower jaw and required removal of bone as well as the cheek. He then developed a recurrence in the maxillary sinus and required a total maxillectomy. Cancer of the tongue has also been associated with chewing tobacco. Since there are carcinogenic agents in tobacco, namely n nitroso nor nicotine, which then mixes with the saliva, any part of the oral cavity which is exposed to this mixture may then be at risk for the development of cancer. There was a recent litigation case in Oklahoma where a teenage boy actually died from carcinoma of the tongue. Interestingly, he had used smokeless tobacco for six years. Although in this case, the court ruled that the tobacco company was not liable, even the expert witnesses for the tobacco company agreed that a causal link between cancer of the gum and tobacco may exist. In some ways, chewing smokeless tobacco may be worse than inhaling cigarettes, certainly in trauma to the oral tissues as well as in terms of nicotine dependence. In Skoll Bandits, for instance, the gateway drug, the nicotine content is 2.2 milligrams per gram. To make it easier for users to get started on the drug, the product is wrapped in a gauze-type pouch. Copenhagen, the stronger brand, is 14 milligrams per gram. For comparison, a cigarette delivers 
0.5 milligrams to 2.5 milligrams of nicotine to the smoker. So chewing tobacco provides a more direct administration. Users absorb more nicotine and dependence is stronger. In terms of dental problems, what are the clinical effects of smokeless tobacco use? These dental abnormalities are recession of the gums as shown in this picture. Periodontal breakdown as shown here and abrasion and wearing down of the teeth. This apparently is caused by chemicals and impurities in the tobacco which erode the enamel. Most of the information we've presented has been focused on the treatment of the complications of smokeless tobacco use, leukoplakia and oral cancers. But I see the treatment of these lesions as only a stopgap measure in dealing with the real problem of how to stop teens and adults before they start using tobacco. This growing problem, particularly among teenagers, may have an even earlier origin. I'm referring to the proliferation of candy tobacco products, pouches of big league chew containing shredded bubble gum and designed to look like the chewing tobacco used by major league baseball players. So children as young as two, three, and four years old are being socialized to the acceptance of these tobacco products. Alan, do you think that the growing interest in chewing tobacco is a result of television and print advertisements? And is there anything that we as physicians can do? In my opinion, advertising has played an important role in the growing popularity of going smokeless. These promotional efforts include television and print ads featuring well-known rock stars and athletes, as well as the distribution of free samples at county fairs and the sponsorship of sporting events. But I think it's a misconception that we can't do anything about this type of advertising. Dr. Greg Connolly of the Massachusetts Commonwealth Health Department and Dr. Arden Christen of the Indiana University School of Dentistry have been major proponents of the campaign against the kind of advertising we see for smokeless tobacco. We in DOC and also the Public Health Research Group have tried to publicize the importance of the way in which such advertising undermines public knowledge about health. As a result, all television advertising of these products has been banned as of September 1986, similar to the TV advertising ban placed on cigarettes in 1971. Still, no one in the smokeless tobacco industry is saying that their product is unsafe. In fact, there have been no warning labels on these products. That's true, but as of February 1987, smokeless tobacco manufacturers are required to place warning labels on these products. These warnings will state that this product may cause mouth cancer, this product may cause gum disease and tooth loss, this product is not a safe alternative to smoking, do you think these warnings will deter potential tobacco users? Oh, I think it'll help, but in my opinion, there are three ways in which physicians can oppose this resurgence of tobacco use. First and foremost is to identify who is using this product and to strongly discourage its continued use. Secondly, healthcare professionals can play a role in the community both locally and nationally. We need to ban and counteract print advertising for this product as well as television advertising. To do this, we must contact civic leaders and emphasize that we can't condone the active promotion of a product that we see hurting and killing people in our community. For instance, writing to commissioners of professional and amateur sports organizations and urging that they join with health professionals in this effort is essential. Lastly, we must direct our efforts toward education and primary prevention. Even if we were to ban all product advertising and even if we could stop individuals from using the product, the lasting effect of the years of promotional efforts will still exist. And as long as baseball players are shown on TV chewing a wad of tobacco and as long as candy tobacco products are being sold, then we must direct our efforts toward a continuing education to counteract the popularity of these tobacco products. This has been Smokeless Tobacco, a new threat to public health with Dr. Alan Bloom, founder and chairman of DOC and former editor of the Medical Journal of Australia, and Dr. Thomas Robbins, assistant professor of surgery, Department of Head and Neck Surgery, MD Anderson Hospital and Tumor Institute of the University of Texas System Cancer Center in Houston. This is the network for continuing medical education, supported by Roche Laboratories.